for us to be able to identify with this letter and with Paul, we really have to ask ourselves uh, some questions. Okay, for example, like how would you feel if and react when you know after teaching, loving, nurturing your children, you found out that eh, they didn't follow your teaching, they turn away in rebellion. How would you react? and feel if you found out that, you know, other church members spoke ill of you behind your back and directly opposed you uh, when you met them. How would, and what would you do if, you know, after you try to explain yourself uh, and justify, you know, your genuine intentions, your credentials, what you're doing, you try to reconcile with them, but there are still others who ignore you uh, and they oppose you. Just... Try to put yourself in, in these situations. How would you feel? What would you do? And this is exactly what Paul was going through. That's what he experienced. Um, he was rejected. He was falsely accused. And yet he confronted the situation directly with firmness, with love, and with grace. And he extended forgiveness to those who opposed him. Um, yeah, and repented. And he also offered comfort and reconciliation to them. And he, he, he gives us a model on what to do when there's conflict among brothers and sisters in Christ. So Paul not only preached about reconciliation, but he personally experienced going through conflict and then how to reconcile with others as well. So that's what we are going to understand from his point of view, understand what he did uh, in this book of Second Corinthians. Going on to the agenda for the next three weeks or three sessions, um, the whole book of Second Corinthians is roughly can be um, organized in this way, okay? Where from chapters one to seven, Paul looks about talks about the past, okay, past misunderstandings that he have he has with uh, the Corinthian church with the with the people there, and he tries to explain himself. He tries to reconcile with them uh, to have forgiveness in the relationship with one another. So that was the past, and then chapters. 8 to 9, it's really then talking about the present. Then he wants to address a present situation, a present issue at hand with them, a project that they set out to do. Okay, And then from chapters 10 to 13, then it's talking about the future, future where he's giving a warning about the future. He's giving a, a chance for those who are unrepentant to repent, to change their ways. And he's talking about he's going to come to the church soon to address all these issues, but he does want to give them time uh, to change and to repent. So that's the future that's coming. So that's chapters 10 to 13. Okay, so roughly it is uh, sections like that. All right. Uh, and yeah, it will be all three sessions will be on Zoom, and you can use the same Zoom link to enter each time. So, what do we hope to be able to achieve or learn from these sessions? More than just uh, head knowledge and about uh, you know the Book of Corinthians, is really then how do we respond to opposition? Uh, and if let's say we have conflict with other brothers and sisters in Christ, how do we respond? We want to also know and learn about God's approach and principles in giving. And also then finally, how do we exercise spiritual authority or how do we submit to spiritual authority as well? So these are some of the learning points we hope to be able to get from the book of 2 Corinthians. So let's go into some background first to understand because context is important. So we do want to understand the context of the situation, put ourselves in the ancient times, uh, in the city of Corinth and understand who are these people, what, what the church is like and all. So if you see from uh, the slide, this is a map. One is a bit more zoomed in, the other one's a bit more zoomed out uh, of the whole area. And Corinth, I'm not sure whether you can see my mouse here or not, but Corinth is over here, okay, in Achaia. Um, and yeah, the zoom in part, it's over here. So Corinth today is a part of Greece, whereas this other whole area, Asia, Galatia, Cappadocia, that's the present day Turkey, whereas Corinth is part of present day Greece. Okay, I give you a idea. This is a reconstruction of the ancient city of Corinth. And just to understand a little bit about Corinth at uh, that point in time, it's really a prominent political city. Uh, it's an economic center. It was a port city. So you can see that it, uh, its position, it's quite near the coast. So that's why it's a port city. 
it is a very strategic location and it is a Roman colony. Being a Roman colony means that um, they have they fall into Roman law, customs, um, and uh, there's a lot of upper class people there as well. Okay, so the structure and planning of the the city planning. Uh, of the, the whole city. It's really quite sophisticated and very organized. Yeah, so you can actually see here, see whether you can see my, my laser pointer or not. Okay, so there is like a theater over, that's over here. Um, there's this temple of Octavia. Octavia, I believe he's the sister of Caesar Augustus and he built a temple uh, to, in dedication of her. You see over this part here, there's this walk long stretch here called the Lacayon Way. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Later, I'll show you some pictures of the ruins over there. Um, this part here, it's, these are stoas, and they're basically um, very, they have high, long pillars, uh, covered walkways that's used for public use, um, discussions, you know, um, yeah, that sort of thing. And over here, the Bima, now, the Bima is where uh, typically, say, the pro-council, when he's addressing the citizens, he would be here. Or there are speakers, orators who want to talk. They will come here. Uh, judgment also that is pronounced from by the pro-council. Uh, any judging uh, will be taken place here as well. So the pro-council will be here. So this is, in a, in a way, an important location, uh, a seat. Um, that is part of the city. Mm, let's see, that's where anything else is interesting. Okay, let's go on then. And so, you know, Corinth being uh, a Roman colony, it was a very wealthy place, but there was also, it had a very sexual promiscuous culture. And there were many cultures there and many religions that were mixed. People worshipped multiple gods. Um, so there would be a god for you know, trade, a god for certain festivals, a god for everyday life as well. It was a popular destination for uh, traveling orators. So in the Greek culture, you know, um, the, the skill of rhetoric was something that was highly valued, right? So orators would like to go there. Uh, they would charge a fee for their attendance, for people to be entertained by their rhetorical displays, their, their speeches. So um, it was, you know, uh, speakers and orators of that time, something like what we have our motivational speakers and life coaches like uh, what we know, like Anthony Robbins, John Maxwell, that kind, right? So that's a place where, you know, these, these uh, speakers would go to to display their skills. Okay. Now this is the ruins uh, of the Temple of Aphrodite. Uh, apparently there were about 1,000 temple prostitutes at that time, serving at that time. Uh, the Temple of Apollo, which is also in Corinth, was the center of homosexual practices where there were young boys that were serving at the temple. So you can see that the culture of the city was very sexually promiscuous, very challenging for Christians uh, in that city, um, in that kind of culture and setting. Okay, This one, it was that road that I talked about, that long stretch of road, the Lacayon Road. These are the ruins now. You can see that it's still, it's really broad. It's very big. So this city is massive and there was some grandeur to it as well. This is a theater, a typical theater. And these are the stores that I mentioned also, uh, the public places for people to go to, covered with very high pillars and all. So this was the kind of setting and place uh, Corinth was. Now let's talk about some timelines uh, of the Corinth church, Corinthian church and uh, Paul's relationship and Paul's interactions in terms of timelines. Now in Paul's second missionary journey, he started the church in Corinth. Okay, So when he was on his second missionary journey, he planted the church there and then he stayed there for about one and a half years teaching and establishing the church. Then he left Corinth, but he sent Timothy to visit uh, Corinth on his behalf. Now, Paul was in Ephesus when he wrote an unknown letter. So before 1 Corinthians, there was actually another letter that Paul wrote. Now, this letter cannot be found anymore, so we don't have any manuscripts of it. It's lost. So, But this unknown letter was written to the Corinthians. But we know that this letter exists because Paul mentions it in 1 Corinthians 
um, chapter 5, verse 9. Okay, and he wrote it because he needed to address the sexual immorality uh, within the church, right? Because, yeah, being in that environment, that culture, it was very challenging. And it infiltrated into the church. Now, after that, it seemed that Paul actually received word that the church was in turmoil. There was quarrels among church members, misuse of gifts, the order of worship, sexual immorality, uh, confusion about marriage, and even uh, pagan worship. Okay, idolatry is still happening within the church. So in response, then Paul writes 1 Corinthians to address these issues in the church. And if you read 1 Corinthians, you can uh, read a sense that the letter has a very stern tone to it. Okay, so for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 to 21, he says, right, some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and a gentle spirit? Can you imagine if your pastor writes to you a letter uh, or drops you as a text to say, hey, some of you have become arrogant. You know, it's a very strong worded uh, letter for so the, the whole of First Corinthians. Okay, uh, and then Paul goes, so after writing First Corinthians, uh, then Paul goes to Corinth. Here, right? He goes to Corinth, but unfortunately, he faces the church open rebellion against him. Okay, and we can gather these bits of tidbits from Second Corinthians as we read. Um, he addresses all these things. Okay, and because he faced that open re rebellion towards him face, uh, in his face, he decided, okay, he will leave Corinth without retaliating because people were not receptive to him at that time. And he decided to extend mercy to the Corinthians to hold back, to not address uh, and, and discuss anything at that moment. Okay, Then when he went back to Ephesus, he sends Titus. So he does write another letter. He writes what we call, uh, what we, Paul re, uh, we know as a tearful and a severe letter. Uh, and this, we know about this letter because he mentions it in 2 Corinthians as well. And again, this tearful and severe letter is not found. It is lost anymore. There's no manuscripts of it also. Um, but he does write that. And then he sends Titus to Corinth with this letter. Okay, to address uh, the issues that he faced when he was there with them, when he saw uh, the, the rebellion, the open rebellion, the sin that they were in when he was there. And he didn't address it there when he was there uh, with them, but he leaves and then he writes this very painful letter to them and then sends Titus off uh, to that, to give them that letter. Okay, and the letter warned uh, the Corinthians basically of judgment if they didn't repent. So, after the they had they read that tearful letter, uh, we we do know that a majority of the Corinthians actually repented, but there was still a minority that was rebellious and that they were influenced by Paul's opponents who were rejecting Paul and the gospel, the true gospel. So then we come to finally to Second Corinthians, and that's where he writes Second Corinthians to address all these issues, to uh, acknowledge their repentance and their change and to write about his coming trip to them uh, to before he heads off to Jerusalem, that he is coming uh, to talk to them and address them as well. So these are the timelines of events. I uh, hope that's not too confusing. So we, in, in a sense, we, we do know that at least, we, Paul wrote at least four letters to the Corinthians. Um, but what we have today in our Bibles, uh, from the manuscripts that we've managed to retrieve and have are uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, okay? So that's what we have with us uh, today in our Bibles. Okay, so the author, Paul, uh, no, no debate about who the author is among scholars, uh, and he wrote it during his third missionary journey while he was in Ephesus. Again, the background and the purpose of the letter is to really talk about reconciliation, he did want to address uh, the financial project that they were halfway through and he wanted to for them to finish that. 
So that's the present project that he wanted to address and then talk about future judgment and warning that he's going to come and address all the uh, unrepentant sin. Okay. In Paul's style of writing, I uh, some of you, you, if you read his letters, you know he is he has very very long sentences, um, and one of the um, uh, traits I'm not sure uh, of whether Paul or any of the biblical writers in the New Testament, um, they have keywords, and these keywords they like to repeat, and so it helps us as readers when we study the Bible is to look out for these keywords, and that's one of the. Uh, things about inductive Bible study method is to look out for repetition for keywords because these are of importance or emphasis uh, and it, it helps us to understand the theme uh, of maybe the chapters uh, in the book as well. Okay, so certain keywords that are here, New Covenant, Repentance, Reconciliation, Suffering, Affliction, Comfort and Boasting. Uh, and you'll see later on what does he mean by boast. Okay, so he really wrote this letter because he wanted to offer comfort to them because they did repent um, after they, they received and read his, his very painful, tearful letter. He wanted to explain uh, why he changed his plans to them, the misunderstanding that they had of him. He wanted to confront certain things that they were saying about him behind his back, false accusations. Uh, and he wanted to encourage them to complete the project that they started about uh, the financial fundraising, basically the collection for the saints. And he also wanted to challenge sin, still those who are, were existing in sin. And he really wanted to challenge that for them to repent. Okay, so if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13 he says this uh, this is why I write these things when I am absent that when I come I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority the authority that the Lord gave me for building you up and not for tearing you down so he really wanted to uh, use his authority as an apostle not to tear them with his words and but really to correct uh, correct behavior, uh, address sin, and to build them up as a church as well. But one of the other uh, very important things which you can see right, from chapter 1 to chapter 7, a very large chunk of Second Corinthians was really to defend his ministry and to defend his intentions because, uh, like I said, there were false apostles that, and opponents of Paul that were just spreading rumors about him, saying false things and accusations about him, and which did influence the Corinthian church, the Corinthians there to doubt him. And so he had to defend his ministry as well. Okay, so he really wanted to uh, get them back on track, so to speak, of the ministry. Okay, so let's dive straight into uh, chapter by chapter. Um, so how we would I'll be doing this is I won't go line by line, verse by verse. That's a bit too much. But we'll basically look at paragraphs uh, of chapters and try to get the essence or the meaning of those paragraphs and what he's saying. Okay, so I encourage you do read uh, specifically the the individual verses so you kind of get the uh, dwell deeper into uh, the whole book, but I will be looking at uh, paragraphs of each chapter as well. And we'll look at, uh, to try to summarize each chapter as we go along. Okay, but first of all, I thought we could talk about this. Since Paul starts with, uh, if you look at chapter one, he talks a lot about the re re repeated word, right? It's about affliction, about suffering. Now for us then, um, when think about yourself and complete this sentence, when I am afflicted or suffering, I will dot dot dot. Maybe if you want to put it into the chat, you know, uh, we can see some of your response. And when I talk about the context of affliction and suffering, uh, it could be like maybe difficulty at work, um, you're facing some uh, persecution, or you have a difficult boss. Maybe you're, you're struggling with an illness, you've fallen ill or you're in pain. Yeah, in whatever forms you may think of for yourself as you think that you're in, in terms of suffering or affliction. So when I'm suffering or afflicted, I will complete the sentence. Yeah, so a different one of us have different response uh, when it comes to suffering. 
and we want to see Paul's response and what we can learn from that. Okay, ultimately, it's really how we can learn from Scripture to grow stronger, to be built up by Paul as well. Okay, so let's dive straight in chapter 1. So we're going to do chapter by chapter. Okay, so chapter 1, um, Paul starts his letter with his usual greetings, right? Uh, I, Paul, the Apostle of Christ. Uh, and he identifies who he's with. Timothy is with him. He addresses the church. Uh, so identifying himself, writers, who are just his co-workers, and who is the addressee of this letter, the saints. But then we will see um, that from verse 3, to seven, he doesn't really have a very typical response to suffering. And uh, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who comforts us in our affliction so that we can comfort others. Now, uh, some commenters have called this part a doxology, actually. It is a praise to God. Praising God, even though he's going through suffering, uh, he's praising God for comfort. And he is emphasizing on the purpose of suffering. Uh, but And he's also contrasting suffering or slash affliction with comfort. Okay, so you see the key words that are repeated in these few front verses. Suffering, affliction, and comfort. Okay, uh, And he's saying that he sees suffering as a way for him to trust God. So that um, as he receives God's comfort, and learns how to trust God, he then is, through that suffering, he then is able to go to others uh, to comfort them, to minister to them, to help them when they are suffering. So right at the start of this letter, uh, we can be encouraged to know that if we are going through times of suffering, uh, well, we know that, number one, God provides the divine encouragement for us in difficult times. And trials and suffering are an opportunity for us to trust God, just like how Paul saw it. And whenever difficult, whatever difficulties that we have gone through, and when we experience that, it's really actually uh, an equipping in a sense or an opportunity for us to then be able to empathize with other people and what they are going through. And that's so that we can provide comfort and encouragement to others as well. Okay, so we can be through the suffering that we've gone through, God can turn that around and use us to be a blessing to others uh, through our suffering. And that's always been a call of Christians to be a blessed, to be a blessing, but suffer also so that we can be a blessing to comfort others as well. So that's, uh, you know, right off from Paul, uh, how he sees and his perspective of suffering. Now we carry on to verse 8 to 11. You see words that he uses okay, when he talks about affliction. We are so utterly burdened, he says. We, are, uh, we received a sentence of death. We are despaired of life. So you see that the tone uh, of uh, Paul's letter really shows his vulnerability, his uh, inadequacy. He's feeling really despair and he's basically revealing his weakness to uh, the Corinthians, to his listeners, uh, and, and basically they are his spiritual children. He is really showing uh, his vulnerability and weakness. Yeah, so as you can see, right, I mean, you, we think about ourselves, um, typically we don't want to reveal our weakness or, or share our inadequacy because of all those reasons that we said, right, or there may be other reasons as well. But here, Paul, can you imagine Paul, the apostle, he is just being super vulnerable to, and these are his spiritual children, this is the church that he planted, and he's just revealing his weakness and being very authentic with them. Okay, so I think some questions that I thought I could pose just for your personal reflection, you don't have to answer them, but just for you to think about is that do you feel as if you know you need to always show a victorious Christian living to others in order to be seen as a good Christian? Um, we cannot show our struggles or true feelings. Or do we often put up a front in church or put on our Sunday face um, because we fear of losing respect or we fear being criticized or uh, fear of losing face, uh, you know, um, embarrassed when we come to church when we reveal our weakness and then we put up a mask. And so that's something for us to think about. If church is a place where it is 
supposed to be a safe place where as brothers and sisters, we accept one another, we love one another, we are patient and kind with one another. Uh, then by right, it shouldn't be a place where we feel we can't be vulnerable. Um, so may I suggest that can we start with our connect groups for those of us who are in connect groups? Then can we start there to let it be a place where it's um, we want to be authentic with one another, but we do have to make sure that, yeah, we keep confidentiality and respect and honor each other and that it can be a place where we can really share our struggles, be vulnerable uh, and pray for one another because no one is perfect. We, many may be struggling with different things. Some of us may be at high, some of us may be lows in our spiritual work, but we can help one another along the way as well. So just like how Paul was just being really vulnerable with the Christians, can you imagine the whole church, the whole Corinthian church is reading his letter and they're hearing about how he's feeling so utterly burdened and how he feels like he receives a sentence of death. He's just really burying himself. If Paul can do that, do we dare step out of our mask uh, and just be vulnerable with our fellow brothers and sisters uh, and let us start with our uh, connect groups. And when we, on the opposite hand, or on the opposite side, hear someone who is being very vulnerable, uh, who's struggling, can we then offer that support and not judge uh, and not, of course, keep confidentiality uh, and love one another, and patient with one another. That's the challenge for us, as just as Paul uh, is doing that as well. Okay, so Paul's approach to ministry, you can see in how he helps them, is not that he's a super Christian. Okay, he wants to show the Corinthians that uh, you know, identify with his weakness, his faults, his failures. He's just any other human being. He has faults and failures and he, he's revealing that to the Corinthians to see that. And to these same Corinthians, um, Paul actually writes in the earlier letter in First Corinthians, right? He writes that I have become all things to all people that by all means I may save some. So he, he says, oh, okay, yeah, I want to identify with anyone who, who I meet. But then a few chapters down the line uh, in the first Corinthians, he also writes, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So I, as I, Paul, imitate Christ, you imitate me. Now, then here's the paradox. Is this possible? Did Paul compromise to be like others? He's saying, right, I tried, I become all things to all people. So he's identifying with all people. Did he compromise the message just uh, so that, you know, he can identify with people? But yet he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Is it possible to do both? Is it a paradox? Um, and I would like to say, no, it's not. Paul is not a chameleon, you know. He would change his message to suit his audience or he compromise. He will not compromise the gospel in order to please the listener. Not like that. But Paul did imitate Christ in how he relates to people. So look at Jesus' example. For, uh, and we read that in the Gospels. Jesus associated with all kinds of people, with your high-level uh, uh you know, your the literate, your Pharisees, Sadducees and all that. Uh, but he also uh, edu we've met with lowly people like the disciples, fishermen who were uneducated. But he spoke their language. And when he called them to follow him, he said, I will make you become fishers of men. So he learned how to tweak his language for them to be able to under understand. When Paul met uh, Nicodemus, now Nicodemus was a scholarly Pharisee. And because of that, Jesus knew how to uh, talk to them about spiritual birth, okay, something a bit more uh, at the spiritual level. When he met, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, he started his conversation based on her needs. She was drawing water, and so he used that as an entry point to talk to her about water and to talk about living water. So Paul, in a sense, imitated. Jesus in this very aspect. He interacted with people of different social status, whether Jew or Gentile. He tried to build bridges to spark and grow conversations with them. And he didn't put up walls or division lines, lines of divisions and all that stuff. So that's how he uh, 
in a sense, became all things to all people, but yet he was also imitating Christ and asking pe- the disciples or his, the planted church to imitate him. So the thing that I can think about, um, the ultimate example of being all things to all people to save is actually Christ himself. If you think about it, he, God, uh, became man, literally, human flesh, in human flesh form. He is divine, who left glory, heaven, gave up his comfort, honor, to become human man. And that's how he became uh, to identify with us. And so that he can bring us comfort, uh, and that we can see God and see him as an example for us to imitate him as well, to imitate Christ. So that's how Paul was really living out and imitating Christ. Now we go to verses 12 to 24. Okay, so just to understand some background, um, there was opposition against Paul. Now what was it that they were opposing him about? So Paul was actually supposed to visit Corinth, but he didn't. And there was a change of plan. So as a result, there were some accusations against him. They say, ah, bro, you brought that, like, you flip there, flip there, you can't be trusted. Okay. And not a person of integrity. And so because you can't be trusted, so then the Corinthians started to question, oh, then maybe uh, whatever Paul said, like his message can't be trusted or so. Was he really from God? You know, he's, we question his integrity. So in this section of uh, chapter 1, verses 12 to 24, he, Paul is actually putting a defense of himself and clarifying the misunderstanding uh, of, you know, why he didn't go a- and visit them. So he ex- was actually explaining to them that um, he was planning to go to Corinth on the way to Macedonia, but he decided not to go to Corinth. So if you look at, Verse 23, he uses the word to spare them. To spare them from a personal visit where he would actually go, if he had gone, he would have given them a very strong rebuke and it would have been very painful for them to receive that. So Paul actually wanted to give them time to, to stay away from them first, to give them time to repent, to correct of their sinful behavior. And so that is why he sent Titus with that tearful, sorrowful letter and waited for Titus to report, you know, what was their response to that letter. So with this explanation, he wanted them to understand that his change of plan was not because he was a fickle person or that he is a person of integrity and of his word. And he wanted to make sure that the Corinthians understood that he, uh, Silvanus, also known as Silas and Titus, whatever they preached about Jesus was absolutely true. So he was defending his ministry. He was defending the gospel message that he uh, he shared with them in the past. And he had to do this because there were opposition, opponents of Paul, false teachers that were spreading all these rumors and trying to instigate the church against him. And so he had no choice but to uh, defend the, his ministry and himself. So in summary for chapter one, okay, mainly... Um, we want to try to summarize each chapter either by looking, trying to put it in a sentence form or identify a theme. Again, this is one of the inductive Bible study methods so that it helps us, number one, from all that whole chunk of reading, how do we concise it into something that helps us to remember what that whole chapter was about? Okay, So we can put it in either a sentence or a, a few words. Um, so really, it was about affliction and comfort and Paul's plan to visit Corinth. Now, picking out some of the keywords, like I mentioned, keywords help us to identify uh, his emphasis, uh, the things that he wanted to highlight or the themes of the chapter. So keywords like affliction, suffering, and comfort. Okay, so these are things that we can remember. So if you want to, in your uh, either you want to write it in your own Bible or you want to write it in the, the printout, of the scripture passages along the blank margins, you can actually just write and annotate these uh, summary, the themes, and the keywords as well. All right, so as we start chapter two, um, here is where Paul refers to that letter that we, that's no longer available for us, that he refers to, uh, or what we know as a sorrowful or tearful letter. So verses three and four, he says, I wrote to you with many tears. Okay, so he writes uh, 
um, he's actually referring to a, his very painful visit. Remember before he wrote his tearful letter, when he vi did visit them the last time, there was direct opposition against him, right? Uh, and so he left. And after that painful visit, then he decided to write this tearful letter. So he was referring to this letter. And you, again, you can see the languaging uh, in Paul's letter in 2 Corinthians. It was really heartfelt love for the Corinthians. Um, he wrote because he wanted to let them know of his love for them. Can you imagine, uh, here is Paul. He is on the receiving end of opposition, of uh, false accusations, of mistrust. And yet, he is the one that is writing to them to tell them uh, how much he loves them. Yeah, that's the amount of love that Paul has for them. Because this is the church that he planted. He discipled the people. He was there for one and a half years teaching them. Uh, and then because of sin, because of false teachers, rebellion, they opposed him, they accused him, they doubted him. And yet, despite of all that, Paul writes to them to say that he loves them. That's really quite amazing. Now, how can Paul forgive and reconcile uh, with them after so much hurt and conflict within the church? Um, typically, you, you hear of uh, two responses when it comes to such situations, when there's conflict or when there's danger. They call it the fight or flight mode, right? But I think there's three. So, for example, fight. And this in the context uh, of a church, maybe. Yeah? Uh, when there are fights and arguments within the church uh, among brothers and sisters, some may continue to argue and fight to, to try to win uh, the argument over that person, to want to put their point across, to want to have their agenda uh, being uh, made and, and to come to pass. So that's the fight mode. Now the flight mode is, okay, la, I don't want to fight with you. Uh, I change church, yeah. Uh, I go to another church. Uh, you know, I've been hurt by this other person in this conflict, and so I change. I stay away from that person. That's the flight mode. But then there's the freeze mode, and I think this is the third one. Okay, I won't fight you. I won't change church. I'm still staying here, but I give up. Uh, I don't want to serve. I don't want to interact with people anymore. I exit from my CG. I exit from serving. I feel very discouraged and sad. Uh, but I just stay on, and I don't do anything. That's the freeze mode. And sometimes a freeze mode can lead to uh, a downward spiral, discouragement. If the situation is actually very bad, it might lead to depression. It, it can also lead to a very a heart that is frozen, a hardened heart that is frozen towards God and towards other people as well. And we put up a wall where we don't want to get hurt again. And this happens even within church. And we see that. Now from... Chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, we actually see Paul was addressing the church as a whole in uh, how to reconcile in extending forgiveness and how he himself is extending forgiveness and how the church can extend forgiveness to apparently this one unnamed person uh, referred to as him and such a one. Okay, And apparently this person has caused a lot of sorrow to the Christian community. You see that in verse 5. So maybe this could be one of the strong opponents of Paul or it could be a, a false teacher. We're, we're not sure. But he has caused a lot of sorrow to the church community. Now, majority of the church community actually punished this person already. What form of punishment... Um, yeah, we are, we're not sure. Maybe they excommunicated him. Maybe they don't talk to him anymore. You know, uh, they, they stay away from him and isolate him. Um, but Paul says, enough. Don't punish him already. Okay? Forgive him. Extend comfort to him so that this person doesn't feel too outcast and guilt-ridden. Okay, that's verse 7. And on top of that, not just extend forgiveness, on top of that, reaffirm love for him. So let him know that he is loved. Okay, go the extra mile to let him know that he is loved. And he's telling the Corinthians that by doing this, you are showing that you are practicing obedience to Christ's teaching the, of forgiveness and loving one another. And that's what Christ called us disciples to do, right? Love one another so that others will know you are my disciples when you love one another. Uh, 
So he's asking the Corinthians to practice what Jesus taught. And that's discipleship. Remember, make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. He is discipling the Corinthians to obey what Jesus taught, to extend forgiveness and to love one another. And Paul then uh, adds on to say in verse 10, he also forgives this person. So that means we can kind of deduce that this person actually, uh, yeah, did oppose Paul or uh, has conflict with Paul and did something uh, wrong towards Paul, but Paul extends forgiveness to this person. And why is that so important within the church, among brothers and sisters? Uh, and Paul emphasizes that in verses 10 to 11, because Satan tries to cause conflict and dissension among the body of Christ within the church. He uses conflict and he sees, oh, okay, there's an opening there. People are not getting along. And he's going to use that to cause disunity uh, and a breakdown in the church. And so Paul recognized that. And he said, you know, I don't want to let Satan take advantage of this situation. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, let's show a forgiveness. Let's not use unforgiveness to cripple my life, ourselves, and also cripple the church. And so this is something that we can learn from Paul as well. It seems the easier way and approach uh, to conflict is to either fight, to fly, to that means leave, or we freeze, we don't care. may seem easier and it is difficult, right, to go and reconcile with someone, to forgive, to show love, to talk through uh, the issues at hand. But as disciples of Christ, we are called um, by Christ to follow Jesus' ways. And Jesus' kingdom ways are not of the world's ways. It's an upside-down way, right? And it's to forgive. It's to reconcile. And to take one step further, it's to show love. That's what Paul was teaching in uh, this church and telling them to do, okay? To address the situation. So chapter 2, mainly that that Paul was trying to address, sorrow from his letter, uh, and to clarify why he didn't go there because he, he went to Macedonia. So the key words is sorrow, forgive. Okay, so those are the, some of the key themes uh, inside chapter two. So we're going to chapter three. Okay, now chapter three, you will see repeatedly in chapter three uh, words like spirit, glory, reveal uh, or unveil. And these words seem really totally unrelated, but yet he puts them all together in sentences and paragraphs. And so huh, what's that all about, right? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be connected. And sometimes when you read Paul's letters, it's like, huh, what are you talking about? But let's try to unpack it a little bit, what he's talking about. Okay, so during Paul's time, his okay, chapter three, yeah, Paul's time, um, one of the practices of itinerant ministers was to use letters of recommendation to establish their authority that they were actually legit preachers and teachers. It's something like, uh, you know, when we, when we fresh grads, let's say if you're applying for a job, you ask your supervisors or your internship supervisors or teachers to write a recommendation letter for you to try to boost uh, your you know, your credentials and all that, right? So something along that line. But for itinerant ministers, yeah, it's also for credibility, for authority uh, when there is a letter of recommendation. And we actually do see that in Paul's life, him being recommended and he recommending other people. So if you read the book of Acts chapter 15, uh, the apostles actually wrote a recommendation letter for Paul and Barnabas. Now, Paul at that time, the early part of, of his ministry after he came to know Christ. Um, he wasn't, well, he was well known in a, in a negative way. Uh, everybody knew that he was a persecutor of Christians, right? Uh, and so, uh, but as a preacher, as a teacher, as an apostle, people didn't really see him as that. So when he first started ministry work with Barnabas, uh, then the apostles had to testify and attest that, hey, you know, he is now one of us. He's a Christian. He's a fellow brother in Christ. He's a believer. And so they wrote a letter of recommendation uh, for him. And when he, Paul and Barnabas went uh, on their, to the, your missionary journeys, they had that letter of recommendation. Now, Paul also wrote letters 
uh, for other co-workers. So for Phoebe, Timothy, Titus, Epaphroditus, <laughs> and you will see that he's mentioned in uh, his letters in uh, Romans and uh, Philippians as well. Okay, so it was a very common practice uh, to have letters of recommendation. Now, then what's the, what's the whole issue here, right, with the Corinthians? Now, some of the Corinthians were actually questioning Paul's qualifications as a preacher and as an apostle. And so they were asking him, hey, show us your recommendation letter. But can you imagine Paul is the founding uh, pastor, so to say. He founded the church. He was there with them for one and a half years. And they are asking him, hey, show us your credentials, show us your recommendation letter. It's as if, like, now, it's as if I can imagine Pastor Michael comes to church and he speaks. And we say, hey, Pastor Michael, you, you, wait, 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 you cannot talk yet. You, you show us your credentials. It's something like that, you know. Um, yeah, and there's nothing wrong with letters of recommendation and commendation. But what Paul was saying to the church there, that, you know, you, you are my letter. The fact that your lives have changed, um, changed lives validate his ministry. That's the true credentials, you know. Paul was confident that, you know, the adequacy of their changed lives didn't come from him, but it came from God, and their lives showed it. So he wanted to um, tell them that, you know, we don't need this letter. And it is not because of me, it's not because of my credentials, but it's because of God that makes us uh, adequate servants. Okay, so God is the one who makes them adequate servants. So that's why he was addressing this whole issue about a letter of recommendation. Now, then it's very strange. Why did he then start talking about um, spirit, uh, ministry of death? What is this ministry of condemnation and glory and all that? So here, Paul actually goes into a very clever wordplay on the word letter. So in our English translation of the Bible, we still see the word uh, letter being used in verses 1 to 3, 6 to 7. But if we look at the Greek word, the original word for letter uh, in verses 1 to 3, it is epistole. Okay? And the meaning of the word epistole is uh, letter, really, la, like uh, that kind of letter. That's where we get the word epistle, okay? Paul's epistles, epistole. That's verses 1 to 3. But then Paul goes into that clever word play, right? When he then, in verses seven, uh, 6 and 7, he changes. He doesn't use the word epistole. He uses the word grammar. Now, grammar is also a word that can be used uh, meaning letter, but it has a wider range of usage of the word. So grammar can be a document, a record but it's also used to refer to the sacred writings of the Old Testament, which basically means the law and which is also the Old Covenant. So grammar or this letter was referring to the Old Covenant. So from the topic at the start, he was writing, he was talking about letter of recommendations, right? And Paul then moves to talk to talk about another type of letter. Uh, and you see that from the whole chunk of verses 1 to 11 in chapter 3. Now that, so how does the flow of thought go? Huh? The Corinthians wanted a letter of recommendation about Paul. He says, okay, you don't need, you don't need one. You are my letter of recommendation. And then he says, you know, but I am not adequate to make that change in your life because your changed lives, you are the showcase of uh that recommendation, right? Your changed lives is because of the Spirit of Christ that does the change and the transformation in your life. So the old letter, grammar, which then refers to the old covenant, the grammar, uh, the old covenant points out sin and condemnation. But the new covenant through Christ and the Spirit gives lives and then, and that is the one that brings about true change and transformation. 
the old covenant grammar can only point out faults, failures, and sin. That's the use of the old covenant, the old testament. But the new covenant in Christ through the Spirit can truly bring about transformation to holiness and glory. So that's the whole chunk of what he is talking about uh, in terms of this letter that he's referring to. Now, then he goes into this whole part, part in verses 12 to 18 to talk about Moses. Okay, why is it? Why did he bring in Moses now um, suddenly? Well, it's not Motintin, he has a reason. He's actually comparing and contrasting his ministry with the ministry of Moses. So, uh, and that is in Exodus. You can read that in Numbers and Exodus. He's actually comparing that, you know, like Moses, he's leading a group. So Moses was leading a group uh, through the wilderness, the Israelites, right? And the Israelites in the wilderness, they were like the Corinthians. They were challenging uh, Moses' authority. They were opposing him. They were complaining. They spoke ill of Moses and they even wanted to kill him. So you can read all that in, in Numbers and Exodus. But, you know, when Moses went to meet God, after he met God, his face would shine with glory. Right? There is a shine on his face in Exodus 34. Now, the shining face of Moses actually gave him sort of like a stamp of authority, sort of like a letter of recommendation. Why? From God to prove his spiritual authority. So that shining face show kind of gives him that stamp to show that, yeah, he has that spiritual authority. But Moses realized that after a while, the shining glory on his face will start to fade away. So what did Moses do? He put on a veil to cover his face so that people cannot see that that shining glory is fading away. But Paul, in contrast, then says he's not like Moses. And he says, we are bold. We are bold to unveil to you and reveal myself to you, to you, the Corinthians. Because Paul's mentality is that it's not like, oh, see how good am I, you know? Um, but rather see my weakness and see what is God doing to me, a sinner, to transform me. He's willing to show his weakness. He unveils and shows his weakness to them, unlike Moses who actually kept his weakness veiled uh, and covers it up. Okay, So Paul wanted to show that the power of the Holy Spirit is working in him. And again, we see that Paul is willing to show his vulnerability and authenticity to the Corinthians. So really then, the end goal is to be transformed to Christ's image. Okay, so that's why he brings in this whole comparison uh, with Moses. So then a reflection question for us really is, what is one area of transformation over the years that you see for yourself uh, growing as a disciple of Christ. If we are disciples of Christ uh, and we are walking in Christ, there must be transformation, right? We cannot stay the same because the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. So, so in summary, then what is chapter 3 all talking about? He's saying that you, the Corinthians, you are our letter. You are the evidence of change and transformation. And he's talking, and uh, Paul addresses this whole ministry of the Spirit. What does the Spirit do? The Spirit changes and transforms lives. So one of the key words he is talking and erased uh, in this is um, letter and covenant, and mainly the letter referring to the old covenant, glory and the Spirit. So some of the key things that we can take note of in chapter 3. Chapter 4 has this whole thing of a sandwich. Okay, and he continues on with that idea. Okay, so remember, uh, uh, the chapters that we have now in our Bible, they are modern day, put in in our modern times for us to have, uh, to be able to read easily. But in Paul's time, it was just a whole chunk of words. Okay, no, no chapters, no verses. So we must think the train of thought continues from chapter 3 to chapter 4. Okay? His train of thought continues uh, with that idea. And he's, and then saying, okay, earlier on he was talking about how we are being transformed. Uh, the Corinthians were being transformed and changed by the Holy Spirit, right? Into glory. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit to transform. And so he's saying, therefore, even though we are weak, 
the Holy Spirit works in us and God's power is revealed. Therefore, since we are no longer under the old covenant, which points out sin and which can only condemn, but we are under the new covenant where we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Spirit of Christ, which transforms us. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Therefore, it's such an encouraging thing. So this whole chapter 4, you see that in verse 1 at the start and at the end, verse 16, this main idea he's telling them, do not lose heart. Okay, verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, this ministry of the Holy Spirit who transforms us to be more Christ-like, uh, we receive that mercy. Don't lose heart. And then at the end, at six, verse 16, he says, Therefore, we don't lose heart because even though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. That whole transformation process is still taking place. So don't lose heart. Be encouraged. So that's the bread of the sandwich. But what is the in-between, the meats and the ingredients of that sandwich? So that's what we're going to look at. Don't lose heart. And so Paul then compares what's that meat, right? How can we not lose heart? Uh, comparing the earthly things with the heavenly things, with the temporal seen things, with the eternal unseen things. And again, this is another observation method uh, for inductive Bible study pick out and look for uh, opposites, how the writers, the biblical writers compare and contrast things. Okay, So that helps us to then be able to uh, understand and look at the differences. So what are these things that Paul is comparing and contrast? So between the sandwich of the bread of don't lose heart, then in between those verses, he's picking out the differences of how the meat on how we don't lose heart. Okay, the God of verse 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Okay, that's the temporal, that's the earthly things, right? But the heavenly things, um, the gospel, Christ, the image of God. Verse 5, not preaching about ourselves, because preaching about ourselves is wow, we, we boost ourselves. That it's temporal only. And this is what exactly what the uh, the opponents of Paul and the false teachers were doing. They were they were boasting about themselves. They were preaching about themselves. But no, not that. But of Christ, everything is about the gospel. Everything points. Uh, they preach about Jesus Christ only, the heavenly eternal things. Okay, he compares uh, and says that we are like earthen vessels. That's temporal. That's earthly. But what is the heavenly? What is the eternal? The greatness and the power comes from God. Uh, it's not us. Okay, again, comparing that contrast. Verse 7. What else? Some more. The whole uh, of all the other verses, and we, we uh, these are quite familiar verses of us, and it's in a song, right? Um, verse 8. We may be afflicted, we may be perplexed, but we are not crushed. We are not despairing. The earthly things, the temporal things now, we may be per persecuted. Uh, the eternal things, we know that we're not forsaken. We are not destroyed. We will never be destroyed. Um, verse 10, 11. Okay, we risk our lives. We may be suffering now. But what is the contrast? We suffer now, but Christ is evident in our life. The visible things, the seen things, the outer man of physical bodies, we may be decaying, we are breaking down in our bodies, but what is the eternal things? The inner man is being renewed day by day. And so he's telling them, verse 18, don't look at the visible things because these are temporal, these are earthly, but look at what is not seen. Look at the eternal things, the heavenly things. And so our confidence is not based on others' performance or ability or our own performance and ability because we will fail and then we will be disappointed. Now, often we have, some of us, sometimes we have great respect and we look up to certain uh, leaders and these leaders could be secular leaders or Christian leaders and we look up to them. They seem spiritual giants to us. But then... Well, a bomb drops and we find out about their moral failings, about their family problems, about, and we have seen also uh, 
spiritual leaders who fall out of faith. Now, if we look at these things, for non-Christians, for non-believers, when they see the failings, especially of Christians, maybe it validates their belief that, see, you Christians talk so much about righteousness, the integrity, uh, you call non-Christian sinners, la, but look at you, you're no different. Right? Wow, God is not real. When they look at men, and they come to that conclusion. When Christians see failings of Christian leaders or people they look up to, maybe we might get disappointed or discouraged. Wow, how can this person do that? Wow, so disappointed. And I mean, the past few years, we have seen such cases, right? Unfortunately. And for some, their faith gets shaken or they start to doubt God. They start to doubt the church. They lose confidence in the church. Now, if we put our confidence in how well we live or how well others that we look up to live, we may be discouraged and we may be disappointed when we see failure. When life is good, when things are going well, we praise God and we say, oh, God is good. We are blessed. But when trials and persecutions and sickness come, if we look at the temporal earthly things, we will lose courage. But if our confidence is placed on God, who is the source of all change, change of human hearts, transformation of the inner man, um, we know that we are not crushed, we are not despairing, we are not forsaken, we are not destroyed. And Paul knew that. Paul knew that we are merely jars of clay, very fragile, very temporal, just the soil. Where is your confidence placed? Is it placed on jobs? Is it placed on connections, on status, on financial standing? Sometimes we may even mistakenly place our confidence on how much Bible knowledge we have or we place our confidence on people. Now, if we look at things that on the left side of the screen, the earthly temporal, um, and those things fail, we will be disappointed and discouraged. But if we focus on the things on the right side of the table, the eternal things, um, the heavenly things, then we have confidence and we have hope. So that's the, the meat between the bread. Um, that's why Paul says, don't lose heart. The, the, it's a sandwich. Don't lose heart. Why? And then the meat. Place your confidence on the eternal heavenly things. Okay, and so the summary then uh, of chapter 4, don't lose heart, okay? That's the key thing that Paul wants to tell them. Don't lose heart. Our outer shell may be decaying, maybe uh, just breaking down, but Christ is manifested. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. And that's from the earlier thought in chapter 3. Okay, so don't lose heart and Jesus Christ. We have Jesus Christ. That's why we can don't lose heart. Okay, Paul planned to visit the Corinth, uh, but he wanted to tell them, about his affliction and uh, how he was comforted, how he received divine comfort from God. Uh, chapter 2, he went to Macedonia uh, and then he talked to them and he referred to this sorrowful letter that he wrote to them. Okay, Chapter 3, he says, You are our letter of recommendation and we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is bringing about transformation in your lives and in our lives. And so, chapter 4, he says, then don't lose heart, okay? Because even though we are facing affliction, we are on the outer side, uh, we are decaying, but Christ is being manifested and we are being renewed day by day in our inner man. So that's his whole thought process from the first four chapters. Now we go on to uh, chapter 5. And again, remember, still continuing the same train of thought earlier on, okay? And chapter 4, uh, when he's telling them, don't lose heart and don't look at the things that are seen, but look at the things that are unseen. Okay, so chapter 5, uh, he's continuing this train of thought of looking at the unseen eternal things and how we can have courage even though they, it's unseen. All right, And he then talks about in uh, verses 1 to 4 about this house. It is a house uh, that is not made of hands, but is an eternal uh, eternal home. And we are longing for this home. 
and, and we're longing to, to go there. Okay, and how do we know that there's this eternal home, that this unseen home, a house? Uh, and he says that, well, we know because uh, verse 5, we have the Holy Spirit that is given to us as a guarantee, as a pledge from God that there is this promise that we have this house not made of hands. Okay, this unseen house and the promise and pledge of that is the Holy Spirit that we have received. Therefore, we can take courage and walk by faith and not by sight. Okay, so um, therefore, make it your goal to please God. And that's really Paul's motivation in his life. Okay, if we look at chapter 5, verse 10, you can change, flip to your Bibles uh, in verse 10. And why is that his motivation to please God in his life. Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So Paul is saying, you know, there will be a day of judgment when we all have to appear before God to give an account of our life, uh, of how we lived our life. All Christians will be evaluated and judged at the judgment seat of Christ on the things done in our earthly life. Now, this judgment that Paul is referring to is not a judgment of salvation because salvation is by faith in Christ. So, saved already. We are saved. But this judgment and is an evaluation of our deeds of faith and our lives as believers. So, Paul knew that his eternal destiny this house not made of hands, this unseen house, his eternal destiny. Um, and one day, he's going to stand before Christ to judge, okay, to give an account of his life. And that moved him in awe and fear of the Lord. We see that him saying that uh, death in verse 11, therefore knowing the fear of the Lord. And he knows that that's his motivation. And it, and it presses him on in his ministry uh, of the gospel and also to persuade others to do the same. And then he's, yeah, so there he's asking them, um, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your conscience. So we will have to give an account. And um, with that idea, that thought, it is the fear of the Lord also that he has. And so he continues to press on his, his ministry and encourages us to do the same also. Okay, verses 12 to 21 in chapter 5, then one repeated word and the whole main idea of this whole section is about reconciliation. You can see that word being repeated again and again. Reconcile, reconciliation, reconcile, uh, reconciling. Yeah. Now, what is this whole part that he's talking about reconciliation? See, the false teachers at Corinth were praising and elevating themselves. Remember, earlier I spoke about how uh, they tend to boast about themselves, right? Uh, so verse 12, he says, those who take pride in appearance and not in the heart. And he's referring to these false teachers at Corinth. They were boasting about themselves. And then Paul was saying that, you know, whatever we do for Christ, right, we are willing to be thought of as a fool. We're willing to look crazy to you. Um, for the sake of the gospel. And Paul was so fully devoted to God that he had little regard for himself. Why? Um, because verse 14 and 15, what's his motivation? Why do you want to do that? Because Christ did the same thing. And so we see here again how Paul is imitating Christ. Um, how was Christ seen as crazy uh, and, and out of his mind here? Yeah. We read in, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 3, 21. You know, Jesus was so zealous for God. It was recorded in Mark uh, 3, 21. His own family said he's out of his mind. Okay, and there are many things that are recorded in the Gospels to show that people were often shocked. They were offended by what Jesus said and what he did. And you know, Jesus was willing to be called insane, to be looked down upon, to be weak, but the most shocking and seemingly crazy thing that Jesus did was to go to the cross to die for mankind. An innocent man uh, to die for the guilty. That's crazy. You know, and Paul is saying that, yeah, I am imitating Christ as well. 
um, I'm willing to do it for the sake of the gospel, for your sake, even if I look crazy to you. Okay. And that's how, you know, God has reconciled us to him. And verse 16, and he likes to use the word therefore, apparently. Therefore, Paul doesn't judge people from a worldly point of view on what is visible. Again, this whole idea of what is seen and what is not seen, right? Unseen. No, he doesn't judge people from that worldly point of view because anyone with Christ can be transformed and changed to a new creation. Okay, verse 16 and 17. So his confidence in the Corinthians is because they are a new creation in Christ. They are being transformed by the Lord. Uh, even if they make mistakes in the past or when Paul rebuked them of their sins, they are a new creation. And he's saying that. And so because they are a new creation, God has is the one who has done this. God has done that reconciliation. So I want to talk about this word, uh, katola, katalasso, katalasso, right? And, he, and this is the repeated word that comes up in this uh, chapter, uh, verses 18, 19, 20, and reconcile. And what, what's this word about reconcile mean? It's to exchange uh, for value, to reconcile with those who are at conflict, to return to favor with. Okay? Uh, and that is what God did. God has caused an exchange of hostility to a friendly relationship. And in this uh, reconciliation, some things happen. Okay, If we look at verses 19, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to him, not counting their trespasses against them. First thing not counting the trespasses against them. Secondly, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What does this mean? Okay, firstly, when God reconciles us into relationship with him again, not counting the trespass against them means that if we are not an enemy with, with God, we are not in conflict with God anymore. He doesn't consider our sins anymore. Secondly, he has committed to us this word of reconciliation. That means God has deposited the doctrine of reconciliation into the heart of Paul and to all preachers of the gospel, which is you and me. So this whole doctrine of reconciliation is in us to share with others as well. In verse 20, chapter 5, verse 20, Paul and his fellow workers they were representatives of Christ. And so they were appealing to the Corinthians who strayed away from the truth. Remember, they, they started to listen to all the false teachers, right? And he's appealing to them, please be reconciled back to God. Okay, turn away from this false teaching. Come back and reconcile with God in, in your relationship with God. And Paul himself is practicing what he preached. He is the one who is actively seeking reconciliation with the Corinthians whom have wronged him. So actually, he's the innocent one, you know. He is the innocent party, but him, the innocent party, he is the one initiating that reconciliation with the Corinthians. If you think about it, actually, typically, it's the one who is the wrongful party that approaches the innocent and says, hey, sorry, sorry, you know, let's forgive me. And then the one who is in the wrong goes to seek reconciliation, right? But again, Paul is... So it's the opposite here. Paul is the innocent party and he's going to the Corinthians to seek reconciliation. Again, we see how Paul is imitating Christ. Innocent, reaching out to those who are wrong. Right? Christ, innocent, going to reconcile the world to God. The world being uh, those fallen men, the sinful men. So, you know, when I study this and when I think about Christ and when I think about Paul, I, it's really just amazing. And I, I to, to see what Paul done has done, you know, his character and what Christ has done also. And when we read Paul and understand his life and, and what he's going through and what he does, right? I hope we don't have the mentality like, wow, Paul is such a super Christian. I'll never be like that. But rather... It should be an encouragement to us, you know, to have the mentality to say like, whoa, 
I am a new creation just like Paul and I have the Holy Spirit just like Paul and I can be transformed just like Paul to do just that. And I saw, and so maybe that's one of the reasons why he is telling uh, the Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Look at my example. You know, it's not like I'm such a great super apostle and super Christian. I'm, I'm weak, I'm fallen, um, but yet, you know, it's because of the Spirit that I can do all these things. And so, hey, follow me, you know, join me uh, in wanting to walk right uh, and join me in wanting to be like Christ. Therefore, imitate me. Okay, so this whole chapter, uh, chapter 5, then really is about having that courage to walk by faith, not by sight. The whole ministry of reconciliation, how God has reconciled us to him. And so therefore, we continue that message, that ministry of reconciliation with one another and helping people reconcile with God. And again, the key words is courage, reconciliation. Okay, so at this juncture, you know, I want to say that if you are struggling with any sin or addiction in your life, you know, sometimes we say, ah, yeah, I won't do it again, but then we fall into sin again. Have courage and have faith, not in yourself, not in your willpower, but in the power of the Holy Spirit to transform you, to help you break free from sin and addiction. Or if you're facing maybe a seemingly hopeless situation, you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, remember Paul's words, walk by faith and not by sight, that God will carry you through and he will not let you uh, be tempted beyond what you can bear. And he will give you that divine comfort so that after you have gone through this, you can use your experience to go and comfort other people as well. Or... If you have a strained relationship with someone, you know, just like how Paul had that strained relationship with the Corinthians, have the courage to, you know, go to the person to reconcile with them, even if you are the innocent party, just like, like Paul. Okay, so that's the theme of chapter 5.